Hello and welcome to the uh, Virtualization and Cloud Security Podcast. I'm here with Simon Crosby and we wanted to talk today about ransomware. Simon is the CTO of Bromium, a security company that focuses on effectively making attacks and malware not happen. Obsolete. And obsolete. <laughs> Hello, Ed. It's good to um, be back. Thank you, Simon. Now, we've been doing this for, I've been doing the uh, security and cloud security podcast now for what, a couple of years, three, four years, something like that. So Simon's been on a number of times. And we wanted to talk about ransomware today. And the reason why I want to talk about ransomware is that it's not only a consumer problem. In That's my absolutely opinion. right. No, it's it's definitely not. So ransomware, I think, started out, you know, the, the big change was in the value of stolen data. So if you go back to the card theft problem, you know, I could quickly steal some credit card data and uh, go and shop those on a carding forum. But then the bad guys figured out that their business model could change. And the change in the business model was really that if they took advantage of a breach, in other words, it can get onto an endpoint and encrypted the data lo locally, they could, didn't have to steal it and then sell it to somebody else. They could simply charge you for it, and you're the person who values it most, after all, so they can make most money that way. So it was a business model change for the bad guy, but it's been enormously successful. It's grown by thousands of percent in the last year. It has, and not only that, it's not just affecting desktops, but it's actually going after terabytes of storage, and, and imagine it's there's some companies that have had petabytes of storage impacted. Yeah, so so let's let's just think about what the fundamental changes to the attack landscape. What's happening is that just as we as defenders are preparing for better ways of finding attackers who are maybe have breached an endpoint or digging around on the network looking for things of value to steal. The bad guy has, for the first time, figured out a machine time scale breach. So, uh, and by the way, I think it's it's still the case that the world does not agree that crypto malware is universally a, a breach, but for sure it is. Um, if you lose your critical data or if uptime for your organization is important, then this is a breach. So. Just as we, the defenders, are trying to poke around and see where we're already owned and where the bad guy is trying to steal our data, <clears throat> the bad guy now simply has to take advantage of the endpoint or whatever he manages to compromise. And they can immediately and silently encrypt your data, leaving it in place rather than having to go through the rather risky bit of exfiltrating it quietly and then formatting it to get sold on some remote forum on the dark web. So for the bad guy, this is awesome. It saves a whole bunch of trouble because, um, you know, those dangerous bits of going to find things which may be of value um, and then getting it out of the enterprise are, are now no longer necessary. Instead, you can simply take advantage of any vulnerability on the endpoint, immediately impact you, do so at machine time scale, and then before you get your first alert, your toast. Yeah, and that's actually a big deal because by the time you get your alert, so by the time you notice this has happened, it's already been done. So I think there's actually two things that need to be done. One is a way to prevent it. Well, I don't know if everybody's going to be able to prevent it. And the second one is to detect it as quickly as humanly possible, or actually as machine possible, and then do something about it. And I actually have that's some right. theories on how to detect it. So that's, this is a totally different concept because it's actually your response to an incident, whatever that is, that incident is, and ransomware is definitely an incident that could cost billions of dollars or millions of dollars. The attacks have changed recently before they were literally holding you for ransom and saying, hey, I'm not going to let you have access right. to your data. But when you go look at what they're doing now is they're doing the encryption, but even they don't know the keys because they're not actually capturing the keys. So there's no way they're asking you to pay them in Bitcoin and something else that's not trackable. 
and but they're never giving you the keys to decrypt your data, so it's permanently gone. This is a new type of a very malicious version of ransomware. It's actually not even ransomware. It's just cryptoware. They're not holding you hostage. They can't. Correct. Um, and indeed, all permutations are there. I've seen permutations where the attacker steals a copy of your data anyway um, and takes advantage of the fact that you're out running around trying to figure out how to use Bitcoin to pay them to simply take copies of the data. And then you go down various levels of extortion um, related to, um, you know, the, the attacker coming back that is you know, partially unencrypting things or, or maybe coming back up to some period of time. So all those permutations are there, and there are no simple ways to rely on the behavior of crypto malware. The early versions were pretty straightforward, um, but nowadays it's got much more sophisticated. And that's thing, I mean, this is just like our code. Our code gets, starts out pretty simple and then ends up getting fairly sophisticated anyway. So the attackers are doing the exact same thing that good software developers do. They learn from their mistakes and they go on from there and improve them. So we can't Correct, assume they are. that they're and, writing and it's relatively code. straightforward. So here's a simple technique. Right. So um, – Here's a simple technique that I have seen some organizations adopt. Uh, what they did was, this is in a BDI environment, um, automatically mount a share named AAAAA with a bunch of large files on it in the hope that if that gets hit by crypto malware, they can spot it because the bad guy will be encrypting files on this thing called you know, AAAAA. And that would contain you know, not non-valuable data. But so the problem is, that's is you're assuming, they're first, assu but they're assuming that these things aren't threaded and they're actually only doing a one, they do look for one drive and do one at a time and then go to the next and go to the next. That, that, which they don't no, anymore. Which they don't, no. I mean, these things go after all mounted media, period, all the time. It's simultaneous. Correct. Multi-threaded now, yes. So... One, I mean, you can do detection mechanisms in it. I mean, if Bromium vCentry, if you're on a physical box, Windows box, and, and any type of Intel-based box with Intel VT, basically says malware's gone. Because it doesn't allow access Correct. to the drive. Yeah, actually, I do, CryptoLocker is an awesome demo uh, for me. Um, the idea is that no matter how it arrives, it's going to be hardware isolated in a micro VM. Uh, the user doesn't even need to care about it. That is, when the, the GUI pops up, um, it's, a, it's an absolute non-issue. What we also do is we um, hardware isolate access to the enterprise network, so there's no way that malware can dig deeper or go to other places in the enterprise. It can't go to any high-value sites. Uh, it can't access hardware or steal any high-value data because it's simply not available. And there are no credentials or anything of value in a micro -VM. So crypto malware is fun in a micro VM. Um, I was with a customer yesterday, only that in the last month they'd had 12 different occurrences of crypto malware. And typically here, this malware is taking advantage of legacy applications, Java, that sort of stuff, Flash, that have to be present on the endpoint, and so they can't get out of it. So this is a very powerful way of taking advantage of virtualization to solve a security problem because the hardware isolation prevents malware from escaping. But, unfortunately, this doesn't necessarily <clears throat> work on every platform yet. Like, I mean, there's a whole bunch of, the new, new big thing is Linux, Linux desktops and Chromebooks and, you know, Mac, to, Mac, uh, Mac hardware, so there's some limitations there. But also, there are limitations in the VDI world. But VDI itself may be able to solve this problem. Uh, VDI can help for sure, but actually in general, in most VDI environments, you know, the user's productive storage, that is a file share of some form, is mounted when you create either at boot time or at some point in the execution of that desktop. And malware is just going to encrypt that stuff anyway. So VDI doesn't per se solve the problem. You know, no, I think it can, earlier it can versions... depend. I think it can depending on how you use VDI. If you're just using it as a traditional desktop, it won't change the won't change the footprint at all. 
the attack will still happen. But if you're using VDI in a Correct. kind of a unity mode where your browser is in one VM, your desktop is in another, and that browser VM has no access to any shares and it's just presented sure. to you. If you're using That's an application, a very good idea. I, I fully recommend that. The problem, the problem is that very few people can afford the hardware or the complexity of that environment, and very few IT organizations are sophisticated enough to build it and implement it. Well, the and ones that I'm so, talking about are the highly funny, regulated but, industries do do that. <laughs> no, I'm there. I, I, I agree, and I've seen that. Um, you know, generally, if you if you go to Gartner and you say, you know, what are their top ten initiatives for the year, one of them is something called remote browser. And you've recently seen Citrix announce a remote browser. Look, every enterprise has got a bunch of spare Citrix licenses. I fully endorse the idea of running a terminal server or three out in the DMZ and giving people access to that browser as their external browser. It's a cheap and cheerful way to get it. You use up some of your licenses. Um, it's more stuff to manage. It's definitely more stuff to manage. I mean, what, no matter how we look at this, it's more stuff to manage. But yes, just just to be clear, in, in a VDI environment or indeed in a terminal services environment, Chromium can help there too. So we run oh, on, uh, let's see, 50,000 plus VDI endpoints in the federal, U, uh, federal government. Um, and there what we're doing is we're running per VM. In each VM, we're... Um, nest it on top of a VMware hypervisor, and then we hardware isolate each tab in the browser or each document that the user receives. I want to just be very clear, Ed, the, this is not a browser problem, okay? No, it's not. I can uh, show you right now a bunch a bunch of Word docs which automatically pop crypto malware, and in fact, the attack um, landscape has shifted over the last few months back very substantially towards PowerShell initiated or document initiated malware. So, you know, just putting your browser out in the DMZ isn't really going to help. Now, you got to almost put all your externally accessed tools out in the DMZ, and anytime you pop, everything needs it, and that's the problem. Anytime you actually bring up a Word document for the first time, it should be in a, in a captured environment. The problem is, is that the attackers are far ahead of the defenders. And that's a that's a big. They issue. are. Now it's it's a huge problem. And you know, when we start talking about protection, there's only a few tools to do this. There's a few ways of doing this. Not everybody has the skills to put them in play. And nor correct. the money to, or nor the money to put them in play. Some of these, some of these things are not cheap to do. No matter how you do it, they don't even have the the tech, tech maybe not even the people of the able to manage it. So let's look at what they do have. Correct. They look, do have. Ultimately, we have to build. Go on. Ultimately, we have to build systems that defend themselves by design. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Micro virtualization is one such technique. We've seen Microsoft uh, starting to adopt some of that as a core building. Okay, building block within the OS. Unfortunately, I can still use CryptoLocker on top of Windows 10 um, and encrypt all of its storage. But I anticipate that as we go forward, you'll see stronger isolation constructs start to make their way uh, into the operating system, both Windows and Linux. And micro virtualization as a building construct is a very powerful thing. Absolutely. Um, you know, the sandbox in Windows 10, in the, in the Universal App Sandbox is pretty good, and there aren't many instances that I've seen where that, that has been corrupted. Unfortunately, it's not perfect, but it's it's certainly improving. So the good thing is that by design, we can make the world better. And, and by the way, this applies um, in the virtualized world too. So let's talk about cloud, not just end user endpoints. Um, micro segmentation is a good thing. We all know that because it keeps the attacker isolated in a smaller subset of the enterprise app surface. It's a more defensible boundary, and it reduces the attack surface. But even micro virtualization as a as a technology applied within the operating system or containerization of other forms, um, perhaps Docker over time, um, will increasingly isolate. 
smaller components which are harder to attack and which, if attacked, um, yield a smaller attack surface to the attacker. So we're generally heading down the right path. Um, and to my mind, virtualization is a very powerful construct because it's hardware backed. Um, you don't have to rely on you know, software underneath your feet, the operating system to defend you. Um, and it's a very well tried and well proven construct. We're also seeing this increasing isolation show up in public cloud, where I'm very excited to see things like AWS Lambda and function now in Azure. These are, you know, these are powerful environments which are designed to run untrusted code uh, securely. So if you write an Azure uh, function program, essentially you're, it's basically a monster workflow system. Uh, you hand them some code and say, when these things trigger, then run this blob of code. Of course, if you're Microsoft, that's terrifying because they have to you know, take this untrusted bit of code and run it when, you know, when, when it's needed. Um, again, there, principles very similar to micro-virtualization are emerging related to granular isolation of untrusted code um, as necessary in a runtime environment. So I'm encouraged generally. I think we're moving forward. It doesn't solve the immediate problem, which is that organizations are getting absolutely hammered by malware. So uh, another one of our customers, um, well, now our customer, fortunately, um, you know, they've had a marketing person um, clicked on something or visited the site and came back later, and their entire um, their entire ERP world was encrypted simply because that person had stepped away to go and have a cup of coffee and the malware was able to silently um, encrypt basically everything that that person had access to. So um, the immediate and pressing problem is how to make progress against this. If you can't patch, you're in deep trouble. Well, the other thing is, is that if you can't patch, you also need to worry about breaking off access. I mean, true role-based access controls will help in this, but it won't prevent it. But if Correct. you had better controls of who could access your data, you may actually, and quantity of data in, in a short period of time, you could actually get better grain controls over what's happening. So RBAC is a, a different way, but RBAC has to change itself. It actually has to now be time-based. It can't That's be, right. It can't just be, oh, I'm you have access and to... Essentially, you want the equivalent of Automount, <laughs> which we had in the old Unix days, right? Well, we still have it in, in Linux. Um, but when you think about Auto. it... Yeah. When you think about it, in that ERP situation, if I had a tool that said, you're accessing way too much data, you normally don't do that and did this in real time, it could say, oh, shut it off. And that could be a fairly small amount of data, or it could be a very large amount of data, but you would at least cut off some of the encryption and save some of your data. Again, you won't prevent it from hitting in the first place. Now, a lot of people also say it takes training to prevent it. It's like train people not to click on things in their email or in the browser. It's like, well, that's what you do. You're not going to change the behavior overnight. Um, other ones say, hey, prevent anything from mounting on the system. Okay, yes. Yeah, that's the, that's the first step. Why are you mounting some of the stuff? Your so ERP the, program, the antivirus folks have all gone down this path, and yeah. they're, all add, they're all frantically adding capabilities which you know, look for an, an application, so your browser or some XE accessing too much data. The problem there is the risk of false positives or whatever. It's all um, false positives. And the <clears throat> It's still the case that you've had a breakout from your browser and there is you know, malicious code running on the system somewhere. And at that point, actually, you have been breached already and the endpoint does need remediating. So it's problematic. Well, and that boils down to how do you do remediation? Now, when you do an incident response, what I was thinking about, and I actually wrote about this on, the, on TVP strategy. You can go there, www.virtualizationpractice.com and look up ransomware. And if you want to learn more about Bromium, look at www.bromium.com and look for vCentury, that's the product. But when you start thinking about all this, the only defense in depth you have right now is good backup. So as I was saying at the end of the last segment, and we're going to join these together, is that the 
real one solution to these problems is better data better data protection it's not going to prevent the outbreak but it'll allow you to recover from an incident faster and when i mean yeah. da better data protection i don't mean um going to your endpoint and mounting a usb drive and copying it over because as soon as you do that ransomware is going to hit it's going to just encrypt the usb drive and then your backup is useless I'm not talking about something that just copies data over on top of existing data. That would also be kind of useless. You need more of an archival approach, and you need to keep lots of incidents, in, instances with as small a changes in those instances as possible. So those, I mean, we're talking about doing, you know, traditional data protection that we've been trying to do for years, and but we need to add something special to it. What doesn't exist today, when you look at data protection and you go with the instance approach where you're basically looking at the smallest amount of data, they, have hun they could have hundreds of these with like 10 kilobytes or 10 megabytes of data in it, and that's it. That's changed. Yep. When ransomware hits, that changes to the whole whole environment. It's not just 10 megabytes. It's now the size of your, your your machine. Let's say you had a terabyte of storage there, and it encrypted all the terabytes. You backed up, protected all terabyte. It's going to go from 10 megabytes to a terabyte. It's not Correct. going to go in between. Right. I think the the big change that is going to come very soon is that is the combination of crypto as a technique for breaching with traditional attack methods. So it's not going to be simply the case that some user in their PC or even their mounted drives get encrypted. It's that the attacker will then enter the enterprise, stealthily hide, and leave something that will run again somewhere. And the moment that thing gets to run, it will encrypt something else. And so this is the new form of advanced persistent attack. It's advanced persistent crypto which whenever it wakes up is going to encrypt something and demand more money. And so, you know, it's not simply that something will run on a user's PC. It will dig deeper and run elsewhere in the org. And so whenever your storage is available or your applications are available to that thing where the malware is running, uh, bits of it could be encrypted. And that's really worrying because you've actually got to remediate the enterprise or as opposed to just reinstalling Windows on one PC. It's a big deal. Yeah, and you want to make sure that when you're looking at the environment, you need a you can use your data protection if it's done properly and keeping multiple and multiples of these smaller size files. When you start looking at things like that, you can actually use data protection to detect that when I did this data protection, which could be ongoing throughout the day, that I suddenly jumped from a small amount to a big amount, and our data protection tools will need to start telling us that or providing us an alert that this has happened. Yeah, I but, think that you've seen very interesting innovations in the file system area recently, um, and I expect that these systems will start to get instrumented over time. So you could expect that... In, in addition to offering you continuous snapshotting, which is, you know, it's, it's exactly available in various... Talking. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm kind of talking about. <clears throat> These systems will give you a way of knowing that the data consumption or read-write activity is out of whack um, and that you should respond in some way. And the thing is, is the response could be find the previous version that wasn't big, or actually, the response could be twofold, and this is what I was thinking about with, with ransomware is that if I had a, a good data protection scheme that did archiving, not just copy data, but archiving, and that's actually the tough one because all, all the tools, that, the traditional tools to do data protection and effectively backup, not for disaster recovery, but just in general backup, do archiving. That's right. So, but... They throw away them after they throw certain archives away over time, as new ones come in. So they need to be smarter about what they throw away and say, "Hold it! These last ten new ones were like a full terabyte. The previous one was only ten megabytes. You know what? Maybe I shouldn't throw away that ten megabyte one or anything before that yet. 
until I test it. And it could be that right. the user just put a terabyte of data on the system and, and that was it. This actually is imp impacts servers as well because servers, if you got to encrypt a server, forget it. Right. You've lost your business in some cases. Correct. If you, once you encrypt the database, you're done. I mean, right now, there are some businesses that get taken offline. So if, if you're in healthcare um, or if you're in first, you're a first responder of some sort or you're an airline um, and bits of your data disappear, you're in deep, deep trouble. Yeah. Absolutely. And there's companies I know of that are literally on the edge of what they can do because they're running with such um, small margins anyways that once they do get hit with this, their, their company is over. So you really need a good – not only do you need a way to prevent, and we need yep. to get better at that across all the platforms, not just limited ones, but we need to get better at that. But we need a better way to do incident response, but we need our tools – such as data protection, to actually step up and say, hey, there's a difference here. Let me go and investigate that automatically by doing an automatic restore test and actually seeing if I can get to the data. If I can't, it's encrypted. Then I True. go back to the I'm, previous I'm, one and say, get rid of that one, not the previous one. Just delete the ones that are bad. Unfortunately, it's, you know, to test whether the data is sane generally requires application logic, and that's unless hard. You put a, unless you just use a canary. You could, yeah. The data protection itself could stick a canary on the file. But it's itself. a ton of it. Yep, I'm there. My worry in general is that most IT orgs are not sophisticated enough to be able to do this or to think this through. So, you know, sure, smart people like you running your org could could pull this together, well, this but the is, problem is that for the you know for the average enterprise, particularly in the mid market, um, this is really tough because mid market enterprises, as you said, have you know the smaller orgs that don't have the margins, they're um, yeah. less well equipped to to respond. But that's why I think the data protection companies need to step up their their game to say, hey, we're going to automatically take care of all this heavy lifting for you. Putting a canary file out there is trivial. Yes. For those guys, they've already they already got the agents. They could literally stick one out there on every file share, and boom, done. Yes. The yes. So so you can find, you can determine if any file gets mangled. The the question ultimately is, you know, when it gets mangled, what's the state of everything else? So at that point, you better have a good snapshot up to the second of everything else, and then Absolutely. you. And then you have, a, have to have this problem of going to you know, figure out what was the last sane snapshot that you took. And then you go, now if that's your database, you still have a problem there, which is, you know, how far back do you have to roll? Um, how many airline tickets have I sold between when I got hit by malware and, uh, you know, and, the, and the database got encrypted and, and now? So well, it's, and it's a real problem. It's a real problem, and that's where you need a lot more – for protection, you need a lot more a lot more tools than most people realize. For prevention, that some tools exist, but not all of them. But no one, I mean, a lot of these tools are designed more for desktops than they are for servers. Uh, yes. So I think the traditional antivirus guys are doing the obvious, looking for lots of rights. Um, but <clears throat> and and you'll expect that stuff to show up on servers, but. General, this is a much more sophisticated thing, you know. It's something going off to my database, and that's a harder problem to solve. It is, and, and that means you actually have to have good replication. You need to start dealing with archival replication, which is even harder to do. And it, it ends up being you need a lot more storage. You need a lot more capability than most companies have. Hey, but, it sounds like there's a startup in here. Ed. There's a if startup in here. Yeah, there is. <laughs> but when you think about it, there's you, I think what this does is not just make archival a second tier citizen anymore. It actually oh. brings it right up to the first tier. Exactly. We have to get the we, we I think virtualization in the last decade did this wonderful thing, which is allow us to explore the value of availability. It turned out that most people didn't need FT. They just needed to be able to restart the VM someplace else. But in this case, it's much more like 
to fault tolerance, but fault tolerance of the org, of the data, right? Data-centric notions of enterprise fault tolerance. Exactly. If we can go in that direction, I think we would actually have a good, a good way. So my recommendation, as always, we try to pull in recommendations for all of our, our, our podcasts. Um, one recommendation is if you're, on, you're worried about desktop environments, talk to Bromium and, talk to, and look at other ways of using VDI in application yep. virtualization to Agreed. save your, uh, save your yep. bacon, basically. <laughs> Look at what you already have. If you're using it, try to make it work for your environment. It may take little changes. It may take major changes. Just decide which way you want to go. Yes. The other one is look at how you're doing your data protection, your backups today, and how you're doing archive and testing, and see if there's an alert in there. Some of them have it. Some of them don't that say, alert me when I do more data or find a way to do pull the data and do your own test and bring that up to the highest level of alert. Correct. Almost every AP, almost every data protection tool that's a modern data protection tool does have an API that you can query to get this information. Or just yeah, go, to, go to them and say, hey, I need this. <laughs> there is, uh, you know, I think there is a very simple thing you can write. It's basically a few lines of, of, uh, of Python, which is essentially a watchdog that sits and watches a file to yeah. see if it gets written. And if you had a decent file, decent size file in every volume that you have, and, and a watchdog on it that can throw an alarm, that's a good idea. And that's that's, that's a weekend canary, project. That's a canary yeah. approach, and it's really worth doing. Really and worth it, yeah. The other one is limit how many uh, file systems you're actually mounting. Exactly, yeah. Not Don't every, auto mount stuff. Don't auto mount everything for every user, particularly in a BDI environment. It's not needed. Maybe that's where something like app volumes and, and those the <laughs> volume layering comes into play. It's really useful for that, although it's generally been used for the other value prop, which is essentially to mount just the applications in the most sane way to build the desktop. We need to do the same really for the data layer. Exactly. So you can actually possibly apply even that technology that already exists to your data layer for your database or whatever it is. And the other thing is, I'm not sure why you would want to mount your database anyways. You have tool clients that interact with it. Use those clients. <laughs> Agreed. So, a bit, but obviously for a server class system, your database is going to be hanging there, right? And that's the worry. That is the worry because it's the, ser it's the database server. It's your SQL server somewhere. You have to worry about that. And limit. And I guess the biggest thing you can do is just limit, truly limit access to critical resources. Do not just allow everybody to log in. Yes. Don't. So simple things on server class systems. You know, server systems should never have any of the normal user stuff. So no browsers. No mail client. When your when your when your admin is installing you know SQL Server or Oracle or whatever they happen to be doing, don't let them browse the web with admin credentials. <laughs> That's just a bad idea. Very bad idea. Well, not so. Don't allow a mail client to be there because a lot of stuff comes in through mail. You know, Correct. Get rid of the browsers. Get rid of the mail clients on your servers. Let the user's desktop be where those are. Yeah, there are other things you can do. Um, don't don't let PowerShell sit on the endpoint. Now it's a really awesome utility, and some people use it to manage the endpoints and so on. But PowerShell on an end user desktop, yeah, limited value. Take it off. Well, and that's where things like jump machines come in, or what I call inside to inside VDI environments. Yeah, those are awesome. Because then so, you basically are jumping from the desktop to a management console. Usually yep. protected from the outside world, and effectively, what you just did was change tr change to a higher level of trust. Correct, and, and you prevent access to those things from outside the org. So it, again, by the way, this is just all about micro segmentation and layering um, you know, privilege levels into your architecture. Absolutely. So I, I talk about a lot from inside to inside. Effectively, when you change, change trust levels, so if you're going from your desktop where you're a user to, to a system where you need to be an admin, that's a change in privilege level, yeah. privilege level, trust level, 
whatever you want to call it, that's going from a low side to a high side, you really want to make sure that's going through a proper proper protocols. But you're basically saying is, I'm giving you elevated privileges. I'm going to elevate what I'm watching on you, and I'm going to prevent you from doing really stupid things on this by not allowing those tools to even be there. Correct. And those systems are not can't access the outside. Exactly. By now, the way, just, I, another important thing here is never let a user elevate their privileges. So require that if they do some admin task, that it's a different user ID yes. and and that they're in a separate environment, right? Absolutely. Uh, that's, and most people skip that on Windows because I just hit the run as admin because I'm the admin. It's like, no, you are a yep. user, have an admin, you log in as a totally separate account or That's even right. a managed desktop where you're, you're managing all that through one other thing. Because if you have to do an admin action on your own desktop, I'll guarantee you almost everybody has to as well. That's right. So one way to do that is you can just write GPO, which enforces that. Um, and that's the simplest way to do it. You know, people can still do crazy things to try and change it, but that's then a determined, you, I would think of it as a determined insider misuse use case. So in something you would track. Eliminate privileges. There are some great tools for privilege management, by the way, um, in the enterprise. Uh, CyberArk has some good stuff. These people basically are really trying to force rigor into the process in which you manage user identities and, and privileges. And that's what we need for to prevent ransomware is much more rigor on what people can and cannot do outside of their own personal desktop. Uh, yes, it'll help. It'll help a lot. Um, we've given you guys a lot of ideas. Um, as always, let me know if you have some more on the um, using any number of ways. You can get to Simon and I on Twitter. You can skip to me via email and on the website. And um, I think we've gotten some good ideas here. The one thing is pay attention to those privileges. Pay attention to what you're mounting. Take lots of backups. They, and do archival-based backups that do not mount anything. They use a networking or under-the-covers mechanism to do the actual backup. That's right. And don't do full backups all the time. Right. And by the way, Dropbox and Box on backup. They encrypt really well. You yes, know, you do. use so if you use your Dropbox and Box, for example, by the way, using WebDAV is better than using their little local mount tools. Exactly. Exactly. So there's another another mechanism there. And if you do use the local mount tools, you may want to just include that as part of your backup. Yes, but it is not a backup tool. No, too no. Many, too, many, too many people use Dropbox and Box on and all these things or their SkyDrive as their backup. And that's no, no, no. just a bad idea. It's a mounted volume. <laughs> now, Dropbox for Business will actually keep a copy of all your data. Yeah. But it's a copy of encrypted data. <laughs> if someone attacks you, they get to it, they encrypt it. What I do is I have a backup tool that's it's actually constantly running, checking for new files, and it backs up those files into an archive, or an archival database. Thing. Yeah, that's the And it actually backs up my Dropbox as well, the critical parts of Dropbox, so that if I'm sharing things and I don't have it anywhere else that's being protected, I actually protect Dropbox locally to a backup archival system that's actually, even though this is my desktop, oh. it's actually tied directly into my enterprise level data protection tool so that when I look at it, I'm looking not only at my desktop being protected or desktops being protected, I'm looking at all my enterprise protections at the same time. And that's where I need to keep, that way I have one place to do all this looking and all the canaries and all the all the looking for, did I just back up the whole thing? Yep. And that's a good trick. By the way, Ox and Dropbox have great APIs for management, and there are some good Splunk plugins, which would allow you to track the rate at which files are being changed by different users. And you could trigger an alarm based on, say, you know, some user exceeding a certain rate of updates. And that's another kind of out-of-band way of doing something similar to the Canary. Absolutely, because almost everybody has one of these tools mounted. The other thing is, is when you use Dropbox, you may want to switch your stuff, or even Box or OneDrive, 
switch your stuff so can view and uh, view only instead of everybody get write only. Write read write. Make it yep. read only. This is a big deal as well. That way, if they're infected, they won't turn around and infect you because once you're infected, there's a good chance to just cross boundaries. Yes. Now there was an argument on on um, the VMware t- uh, communities forums many 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 years ago <laughs> about could a malware that infects the master boot record actually spread between drives? And it's like yes, it could. But a lot of people said, no, it can't, because master boot records are, like, special. And it's like, well, if I can stick an executable there, I'm sunk. Yeah, you're done. It'll, anything it can mount, it'll get to. So if it sticks it in there, it's automatically executed at mount time. So I wouldn't trust that. That's right. That's right. I have a least trust approach to everything. That's right. We're getting better at this stuff, I think. And... um my biggest worry is the is really the deep legacy base. I'm not worried. I mean, I think people there are lots of tools available, but you know, when they go to large enterprises with heavy legacy dependencies, and um, gosh, perhaps even limited skill sets on the part of their IT folks, that's where I worry. We've got to make this stuff easier to consume. Absolutely, it's it's one of those things where <sighs> you. And it's not only that, this ransomware crosses disciplines. The response crosses disciplines. And Mm -hmm. these disciplines, whether it's IT security, IT operations, which does all the monitoring, can find the stuff that happened, or even the data protection teams all need to work together to say, hey, we have a problem, and this is how we spotted it, and this is how we respond to it. And you can literally make that incident response almost as fast as possible and very very automated so that once someone got hit with malware or let's say a virtual desktop got hit with with ransomware and you did a you were backing up their their user their user partitions their home directory and so forth their their profile and it got hit with the profile you could actually detect those changes because the minimal amount of changes are made to a profile when a user uses it Yep. Hey, so let me give you one other big worry in the context of malware. Oh, crypto malware, I've just remembered. And that is this. Often users, when they see that pop-up screen saying things are encrypted, are horrified by it. They frequently feel shame. They feel like they're responsible. And often they try and go and solve the problem themselves. So quite often um, we see... Crypto malware hit an end user. The end user then goes off to try and find out how to get Bitcoin or whatever other form of non-traceable payment is demanded without telling IT. So there's an important component here, which is to educate users that it's not their fault, <clears throat> that it's just something that's going to happen, and that when crypto malware strikes, they shouldn't try and fix it themselves. That, of course, feeds the beast, feeds the malware guys, but also... Um, the attackers are evolving and they don't really hand you your keys back and, and they may keep a copy of your, of your data anyway. So it's really important to educate users that crypto malware is not because they're browsing bad sites, maybe, but, uh, but that you're not going to hold them responsible for it um, because it's really critical for IT to know. Absolutely. And if you do get hit by this, make sure your IT security department knows that you've been hit by it. Bring it up to them. Don't do anything. Just leave it alone. They may need it for you. May need whatever you're lo- you're looking at for forensic research, so that they can actually go off and prosecute. Yeah, and, and you know, the default user behavior is close the computer, pull out all the wires, right? But if they've encrypted your drives, you know, your monster drives, you're you're done. Once you power it off, you're you're toast because you already have there's a you have saved data in memory, and these keys are also in memory, and there's a way to get them. Right. So let the professionals at it and let them do their job. Don't try to do it for them. Yep. And, yeah, and as a security department or an IT department, educate your users. This is what you, when you hit this is what we want you to do. Yep. And that's a good thing. But also I think it also has to span to the consumer in some way. And that one I haven't figured out how that's going to happen. You know, the, the, the only way to – fix the consumer world is 
you know, the AV guys will do whatever they can do. And then Microsoft will do what it can do. Uh, my recommendation to anybody who's in the consumer world is you know, be on a modern system, be on the latest version of the OS, whatever it happens to be, your flavor. Um, and that increases your chances. But, you know, you know, users at home, are, they're in a tough spot, really. Take the education that you get from the IT organization about this and apply it to what you do at home. Yeah. But, for example, if you're a Windows user or if your mom is using Windows XP, you know, do the right thing. And instead of buying more antivirus, just buy a decent modern device with Windows 10 and you're just in a better position. Absolutely. Well, Simon, thank you very much. That was good advice at the end. And everybody, let us know what your thoughts are.